Paulo Christensen received his Bachelor of Arts at St. Olaf College and his Master of Fine Arts at Florida International University. He is the author of Beneath Saigon's Chao No, a bilingual collection of essay. The editor and curator of In My Ear, Your Voice Still Flickering, a three-part bilingual collection of Vietnamese art and literature, and the co-editor of A Rainy Night in the City, Hanoi Publishing House, a bilingual anthology of short stories. His poetry has appeared in Atlanta Review, Best New Poets, Play Aids, Three Penny Review, Zone 3, and elsewhere. He currently works as a content director for a Ho Chi Minh City-based online publication, which gives insights into the Southern Hub and Vietnam, the country he considers his second home. American poet Paul Christensen has twice won poetry awards from the Academy of American Poets. His poetry has appeared or is forthcoming in many prestigious American literary and artistic magazines. He came to Quy Nhơn in central Vietnam in 2015 as a Fulbright Fellow, and then his love for this land lured him to move to Vietnam. Paul now keeps devoting himself to introducing Vietnamese literary works to the world through his own works, as well as his translations. Hello, Paul, and welcome to Talk Vietnam. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, um, so um, thank you for joining us on Talk Vietnam for the very first time. And uh, what brought you to Vietnam in the very first place? Yeah, I first came here in 2015 as a Fulbright Fellow. My plan was really just to come for a year uh, I just finished a master's program in America and just wanted to take a break and explore a little bit and have a change of scenery. But um, the people I met and the pace of life here and the kind of creative energy that was everywhere really enticed me to stay and fell in love with the place and lifestyle here. And the city um, that you, you stayed in 2015 is Quy Nhơn, right? Yeah, that's right. Try and go back every year, see friends and, and just enjoy the city. Um, Mm. What made you love Quy Nhơn so much? It's very easygoing. The people, the, just the pace. It's a very green, walkable town. It feels very relaxed and comfortable. Yeah, and you know, also in Quy Nhơn, we have a poet Han Mak Tu. Yes, Han Mak Tu, the legacy of Han Mak Tu is wonderful. And just hearing the reverence that people have when they speak of him and how eager they are to share. I mean, it's, it's rare to mention, oh, I like poetry, or I like to read, I like to write and have somebody immediately say, oh, then you must know Han Mak Tu, and how often he came up was really inspiring. And then after that, what happened uh, that uh, led you to the decision to, to move here? Yeah, I mean, I love Quinn Young, but it's a difficult place, I think, to be a young, foreign, creative person just in terms of job opportunities. And, um, but Saigon has that in abundance, you know, the, the creative energy here is just incredible and, and being able to just come down here without any specific plans or, or connections and find them and meet like-minded people um, really drew me here. It could have been Hanoi, but because Queen Young is kind of closer and more associated, I found myself spending more time in meeting people that move down here. You once said in an interview, uh, it's called Thời Nai, and you, uh, I quote you, uh, literature opened up my path into Vietnam. Yeah, so I'm a firm believer that literature is the best way to foster empathy and also understanding. I mean, we can't really get into somebody else's perspective and into their head in any other way better than literature. Um, so when I first came here, it was reading books, reading books in translation, whether it's novels by Young Ong and Ho An Tai or poems like Nguyen Quan Tru, really allowed me to get a perspective on Vietnamese people, Vietnamese culture, Vietnamese history that I don't think would have been possible even through conversations with people, certainly not through just my own first-hand observations. So I think literature is really the way I was able to connect and start understanding culture and people and lifestyle here. And then on the flip side, it's through literature that I've had a lot of opportunities to meet people. I mean, it's why I'm sitting here and it's why 
a lot of the friends I have are writers or are readers, and it's a, a way for an introvert to make connections. I think it's very important, yeah. It's all, all art forms are. Yeah. yeah. But uh, why literature opened up uh, your path into Vietnam? Does that mean that you read Vietnamese literature before you came? So. Uh, yeah, I would say in kind of my lead up to coming here, I started reading it more in translation and kind of looking at younger writers, newer writers, some really great poetry anthologies that have been translated. Um, and then also looking at some of the more canonical works like Dumb Luck, for example, has also been translated. So before I came here, having read those and, and letting that kind of be the introduction to the country was part of that path here. Though born and raised in the United States, Paul Christensen fell in love with the life in Vietnam. Paul leads a simple life where he rents a house and walks to work. Perhaps that is how he discovers so many stories about city workers' livelihoods and weaves them into his writings. Over the past few years, Paul has become a regular customer of this mobile plastic laminating shop. So after walking around um, this particular woman, as opposed to the majority that are mobile, she stays here the entire time. So I came back with my team from Saigonier, and one of my coworkers helped me translate to have a conversation to learn a little bit more about what she does here and her operation and her livelihood and, and the process, which has given me a lot more appreciation for something that just gets part of the urban fabric and passes us all every day. But there's a story, like everybody, there's a story behind her and each of these tiny little operations that go on in the city. Yeah. Now, put this in my notebook, keep track of, add it to my collection for whenever I pass one of the laminators, I try and find something on me to make a little bit more permanent. It's like having a memory be certain to remain a little bit longer. However, Paul's interest goes beyond the convenience of these street services. What he cares about is the plastic laminating truck owner. Nguyen Thị Huan was born in 1967 in a small village in northern Vietnam. Everyone in her community was a farmer, but long ago, many of them decided to move south for economic reasons. She is frank when describing it as a decent way to make a living that isn't as physically demanding as farming. This is especially important considering her husband, who joins her, suffers from several health ailments that make walking difficult. Immersed in the rhythm of urban life, Paul discovered moments of simplicity amid the hustle of workers trying to make a living. He took notes with genuine affection and sympathy. So now let's talk about uh, your book, uh, Beneath Saigon's Chano. Um, why did you choose this, this tree to write about? Yeah, I think everything in that book was just something I was curious about or interested about or appreciate the more I learn about it, including those trees. I mean, I just love those trees. We don't... So it's a collection of different topics. It's not just about the trees. Ah, yeah, it's a collection of different essays, and okay. that's just the title of one of oh, the essays. And when correct. it came time to come up with a title for the book, I tried to think like, okay, what maybe exemplifies everything that's contained? And it's, it's those trees because they are a looming presence kind of for my life here. They're always there. I, I walk around a lot. That's where I think and, and do my best kind of observation. So the topics in the book, whale worship, history of rubber, Saigon Zoo, Tapwa, um, are just things that I found myself interested and in, wanted to learn more. And in the process of discovering more and talking to my friends here and talking to my Vietnamese colleagues, finding out they're like, oh, this is not common knowledge. Not everybody thinks that, about these things or thinks about them in this way. Okay, that's worth sharing, that's worth bringing about and, and bringing to more readers. And then in your essay, uh, a case of coexistence of convenience store and tạp hóa. So what do you, uh, what do you see from, from, from this fact that uh, 
Tapua and the convenience stores are coexisting, and uh, what does it imply about uh, the urbanization of Vietnam? For me, I, I find that the coexistence of convenience stores and Tapua to be kind of an example of modern day Vietnam, or at least modern day big city Vietnam, and how it can straddle the line between traditional and modern, and you don't have to adhere to one or the other. People, especially young people, adapt to both and pick and choose what they like from both. And there is a potential for coexistence, which kind of gives me faith or, or hope in the future of pr preservation, but also modernity and balancing the two. Saigon's Chano are older than telephone wires, older than chainsaws, older than nylon, polyester, and penicillin. Older than motorbikes, bubble tea, bang chang leung, and selfies. Older than airplanes and the defoilants they dropped. Walking down Le Xuan, a summer wind releases a torrent of helicopter seats. The nutlets troll down and flop uselessly on the concrete. Unable to take root, their fibrous wings slum like the dorsal fins of killer whales depressed in captivity. Something inside me heals the same way. Emerging from a soul that loves nature and poetry, his carefully crafted text is penned by someone who continually observes and is moved by the simple and humble details that constitute the distinctive beauty of Vietnam. Christensen's bilingual book comprises eight essays and was published in 2022. The writings encompass Charno Trees, Tap Hoa, and Water Hyacinth, engaging readers in rediscovering the familiar in Vietnam from a captivating new perspective. For example, when observing a Tap Hoa, he whimsically compares strings of shampoo and body wash packets hanging on either side of many Tap Hoa entryways resembling absurd aluminum moss or perhaps a beaded curtain. However, Paul Christensen doesn't just write about the easily visible. He is willing to tackle seemingly challenging topics, even those that might be difficult for the Vietnamese. For instance, he wrote about the traditional rice wine making and challenges faced by artisanal winemakers during the French colonial period. In exploring whale worshipping in Vietnam fishing villages, he describes the relationship between humans and nature and expresses his concern about the gradual extinction of whales. Dưới tán trò nâu Sài Gòn của tác giả Paul Christensen là một tác phẩm rất đặc biệt. Tác giả là một nhà thơ, nhà báo, nên mỗi bài viết trong sách thể hiện góc quan sát rất riêng, cùng nhận định sâu sắc của chính tác giả. Thông qua những bài viết của tác giả, ta thấy được tình yêu của anh với lịch sử, văn hóa và con người Việt Nam. So through that uh, image or metaphor of Chao No, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to imply? I mean, I think it has different attachments for different people. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, for me, it's the historical element that we, I originally assumed that those trees are Saigon. Like, the very nature, literally, are the city. But only through research did I learn, like, oh no, they're actually not native here. The natural flora and fauna of the city in this kind of entire region didn't have those. They were brought here by the French from the highlands, from the Lat and Contum. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, somebody then tells me that, oh no, they just mean childhood for me. Mm -hmm. You know, when the, when the seeds twirl down, that's kind of a nostalgic moment in their Halcyon, you know, growing up in the city. And that's a completely different meaning. And right. so for me, the trees kind of unite all those different elements and more elements of botany and nature and kind of what those trees are doing to keep the city and ground together. And, and so they, metaphorically for me, is kind of how complex a single simple object can be. Right. And also, it's a good thing that because different people can relate to the trees, 
different ways. Yeah. You know, a child maybe is a, a memory of childhood, and maybe some science um, scientists, you know, they know, or biologists, they understand, you know, the origin of the trees. Yeah. Or uh, poets like you, writers like you, uh, looking at it from an outsider perspective, also have very interesting uh, approach to it. Yeah, and and actually, um, that reminds me. I was um, at the big boat races in the Delta, where they have um, every year, they use those trees. They hollow really? them out for the big canoes, like the really long boats are made from those trees also. Okay. So if you talk to somebody that cheers on those races or is one of the community members that races them, they're going to have that connection to them. And they're going to say, oh, yeah, this is a tree, but I just see a boat right. standing up when yeah. I see that tree. Yeah. So everybody kind of has their own different associations. Yeah. Uh, since you mentioned uh, boat racing, um, that brings me, that makes me think of the whales uh, worship, uh, worshipping uh, in the central coast. And I wrote about that because mm. I personally just am fascinated by whales just mm. as this extremely smart, emotionally uh, attuned animal that has an intellect that mm. probably is in some ways comparable to those of humans, but by living in the ocean, their experience is completely different and alien to us. I just think that's fascinating, and they're huge. Yeah. Um, so to then find out there's a connection with a religion or a philosophy, and that flexibility of religion and science and how those two interact in ways that maybe they don't in the West, I found fascinating. So. One of my trips up um, outside of Bungtau to learn more about whale worship, I remember talking with people and they would describe the whales or the manifestations of Kaong that they would encounter. Um, yeah. yeah. And they would describe them and they said, you know, one had flat tail like this and mm. another one had a tail like this. Mm. And actually, if you know anything about whales and dolphins and you know none, actually, that's fish. Right. Um, yeah, and I think it's a beautiful ritual uh, because human pay respect and uh, tribute to to an animal. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's of course there's a you know mythology in it, but um, I mean overall it can help save right the animal and 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 we know the line of protection and and our responsibility to protect the nature. Yeah, I yeah. think it has to start with respect and reverence and appreciation, mm -hmm. and and that's what kind of the whale worship is it's peaceful reverence and taking time to honor it. Right. In 2018, Paul Christensen embarked on an adventurous trip to the fishing village of Phuc Hai in Det Do district, Maria Vung Tau province. This is one of the ancient Vietnamese fishing villages with a history spanning over 200 years. The village is also renowned for having a well cemetery with the most well graves in Vietnam. In the past, there were over a hundred well graves at this location. Although it is documented that the term ca ông may refer to a whale, the local fishers in Phuc Hai always use the term ông or ngai nam hai, god of the southern sea, when referring to this sea mammal. Đó là em kéo lưa, kéo lưa lên, không ngờ còn năm sáu miếng nữa là cái chì là cái phao á nó mới là chói vô cái đuôi ông mới là mới cảo lên ông nặng khoảng là tầm như là 55 kg gần 60 kg mới là tắm rửa cho ông lấy vụ 10 lít vụ á em cúng kính Apart from regularly worshiping and making offerings the locals mourn a well god for three years after spotting his carcass Afterwards they retrieved the bones and placed them in a communal grave for ritualistic ceremonies. Từ đó tới giờ thì mấy chú cũng giữ theo cái phong tục tôn thờ ông là ông thần hộ mệnh của nhân dân Bá Tánh của thị trấn Quốc Hải thì mấy chú có cái trách nhiệm nấu truyền lại cúng và cầu nguyện giáng giá dân sinh ông hồ mạng cho nhân dân Bá Tánh From the stories shared by the coastal community, tangible artifacts, and exploration of scientific research on well rescue stories, Paul uncovered fascinating connections between humans, whales, religion, culture, and the environment. Before I came here to Fukai, 
and I thought about Kaong, and I thought about the belief. I always thought about it from a scientific perspective. I tried to say, well, what kind of whales are people? Are they whales that people are worshiping? You know, why are they washing up shore? What scientific reason can we possibly have? But talking to people and listening to the way they described it and the way they saw it wasn't a matter of science. It was a matter of tradition and belief and their own experiences, which is just as valuable a way to look at it than any other way to look at it. And you once said that um, you would like to think of these essays as uh, love letters because uh, you are very lucky to live in Ho Chi Minh City. Yeah. 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 Definitely. I think in general, there's love letters. <laughs> I mean, a platonic love. Um, I think there's enough negativity in the world already. Mm -hmm. There's enough hate and outrage and anger and criticism. I don't want to add to that. Mm -hmm. I think there's always room for positivity, right. and as long as it's genuine and it's not fabricated, mm. I want to. That's where I want to add. I'd rather be excited, and so if I can write about things that would make me happy and excited, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the, the position I want to be in. Yeah, yeah. Now, a question about uh, the readers of your essays. Um, do you know, do your essays, I mean, many expats or foreigners read uh, your essays or mostly Vietnamese? Yeah, I mean, so when, when my essays were originally published in English for the first time, it was probably about half and half readers for um, foreigners and for Vietnamese um, when they're online through the publication where I work. And I always admit though, like I'm most excited when a Vietnamese tells me that they read it and they connected with it in some way, whether it, kind of the two biggest compliments I can hear are, I never knew that or I never thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. And that sense that I've brought something new to the conversation or to the thinking that an individual has, something that either they've taken for granted or they've just never realized was mm -hmm. worth exploring more or worth thinking about. Right. I think in a lot of ways, expats and foreigners, we can be easy to entertain. You know, like, oh, have you ever seen this before? It's a water puppet. And you know, oh, you know, but, yeah. but to make a local who's grown up around these themes and topics and, and conventions mm -hmm. appreciate something in a new way is, I think, when I've done my job, when right. I've achieved something that's worth being proud about. You know, as a writer, you have to observe a lot uh, of what's going on and then think and then uh, write, right? So the experience of living here in Vietnam obviously is so different from living in uh, anywhere else in the world. So how does that kind of uh, inspire you or uh, help you write um, differently? I mean, just imagine if you were not here, you were something else. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody finds inspiration in different things. I think whether they're a writer or a musician or any art form, people are inspired by different things. And I've just, you know, through trial and error over the years, found that I find energy and commotion exciting. I mean, mm -hmm. Saigon is a good place to experience that but also just um, curiosity, I think for me is a source of excitement, um, not understanding something or finding something unusual or finding something um, delightfully new is how I find inspiration and what compels me to write. Mm. And so being an outsider, being a foreigner here, I have kind of, I feel like I've hacked it a little bit or, or found a shortcut for inspiration because everything Mm -hmm. on some level is new or has the potential to be new mm -hmm. in a way that maybe if I was in my hometown in America, I would have to struggle more to find things that are new or unique. You've curated the project, um, that project, an anthology of works by 20 Vietnamese poets, writers, translators, and artists. Um, so tell us more about uh, this project. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm more proud of that project than I am my own book of essays or mm. some of my own poetry publications. Because there's, I think, enough kind of English writers in the world. <laughs> and there's not as many, there's more room for, or more need for more Vietnamese voices kind of on the global stage. Mm -hmm. So I get more excited for the opportunity to help that than I do maybe throwing my own voice out to the, the mix. 
Um, so this project started um, one of my good friends, an extremely talented poet in America, Marcy Calabretta. She works with a literary organization, and they were doing an event with a Vietnamese American writer's book launch for um, The Best We Could Do by T. Bui. Mm -hmm. And they you know, wanted to know if there was any way they could get more Vietnamese voices. Mm -hmm. So working with um, Hannah Huang, who's a Vietnamese uh, Saigon native illustrator, we worked together to kind of curate and source local voices and mm -hmm. visual artists and yeah. translate and just kind of bring things out to readers that wouldn't encounter them otherwise. Mm. So um, beside that, that project, um, you are also having other projects in the pipeline as well, right? So I work with Vietnamese writers or Vietnamese kind of academic scholars to yeah. translate novels from Vietnamese into English, um, published in America, so they can kind of get a wider audience. Because there's yeah. so many great both canonical works that kind of you probably read in, in at least excerpts of in school when you mm. were in middle school and high school and university. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of those haven't been translated. Right. From Red River to Blue Danube is a collection of poems straight from the heart. Kubik House poems present individual experiences that transcend their private realms and become universal through their astute depictions of what it means to be alive and human in the world. This is Paulo Christensen's preface for the book From Red River to Blue Danube by Arthur Gil Big Ho, where Christensen was the English language editor. In March 2022, the book was launched on Yukioto Publishing's global platform. For the past six years, Paul has spent considerable time collaborating with numerous Vietnamese poets and writers to translate their works into English. Last year, I was able to collaborate with a lot of really talented writers here in Vietnam and artists here in Vietnam for a uh, bilingual collection. This is the first volume of a three-part series of Vietnamese writers paired with Vietnamese artists, fully bilingual. They were distributed with the help of the National Arts Endowment in the U.S. and distributed across Miami and elsewhere. Po đã từ bỏ cuộc sống đầy tiện nghi của xứ sở cờ hoa để đến với Việt Nam. Anh quăng mình vào việc dịch văn học Việt Nam mà không màng đến thù lao. Anh đã và đang hy sinh tuổi trẻ của mình để giúp bảo tồn văn hóa Việt Nam và giúp các tác phẩm văn học Việt Nam vươn ra với thế giới. Um, so now let's talk about uh, Saigonier. Um, you are now the content director of Saigonier, uh, an online media company specializing in uh, social and cultural news related to Ho Chi Minh City. So as part of your work uh, for Saigonier, you write book reviews for Vietnamese authors. Um, what keeps you motivated in doing that? Yeah, I, I mean, I love literature, right? And I, I love learning about new books. Mm -hmm. um, I've had to fight to keep those book reviews there because they're not popular. Like those are not, they're not giving us clicks. They're not okay. giving us likes when we share it. But I think they're important because mm. value and worth is not defined by social media shares and, and right. what's getting the most views. And I think Now, what important. is getting the most views? Food. 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 <laughs> People, everybody loves food. Street food, I mean, that is one thing. I mm. think whether you're a foreigner, whether you're born and raised here, whether you're 70, whether you're 15, you like food. Recently, you hosted a series of uh, Vietnam Discovery uh, with VTV4, uh, and in doing so, you had a chance to drop by a kite flying site yeah. in uh, Thu Thiem, Ho Chi Minh City, and also enjoy street food and experience the tunnel um, in Cú Chi, where you met uh, with some war veterans. Um, so what were... Uh, uh, some of the feelings that you went through during that uh, experience. So I really enjoyed that that position of being able to show what I find unique in the city. Mm -hmm. And maybe the one that you mentioned that I found most satisfying was the, the kite flying in mm -hmm. Tutiam. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like that is because Saigon is can be an expensive city, and I think at least in a lot of views, it 
takes money to enjoy it or to experience Saigon to the fullest, whether that's entertainment or food or shopping. And while that element is true of the city, I think there's also ways to enjoy it mm. for free or in an affordable way that families in particular that don't have a lot of money but still deserve yeah. to be able to have fresh air and time together. Yeah. And kite flying exemplifies that and it's kind of a, a really, I don't know, peaceful, almost nostalgic opportunity to enjoy the city in a way that maybe people don't normally associate Saigon with. And happiness is a feeling, and uh, it doesn't require much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, like the kite flying, it's a way you see people happy, mm -hmm. and you see families together and, right. and really enjoying yeah. their, their precious time. I love the water bus. You can start it right in the heart of District 1. So anything you want to do downtown is right there. You can walk from Windway, just get on the water taxi. When people first thought of the water bus, they pictured commuters being able to go to and from work, going downtown to their home in the suburb. And not many people use it for that. It really has become a place for residents of the city and tourists to get a different perspective, see a different view. Regardless of how much time you spend in Ho Chi Minh City, there's only so much you can see and only so many perspectives you can have unless you come out here to the Saigon River. On weekends, one of the best places to come is out here to Tui Tiem. People like to fly kites, sit around, relax, really provides a perfect opportunity to slow down. I can understand why it's so popular for people of all ages. Kids can do this. It's a great opportunity for parents and children to come together, have a good time, and it's affordable. So much in Ho Chi Minh City is expensive, but here, even families that don't have a lot of money can come have a wonderful time together and not be worried about new technologies or expensive products and just enjoy some of the simplicity of spending time together. Bún này là gọi là diều diều lượng. Diều lượng. Cũng giống như lái xe thôi. Set against the downtown skyscrapers are wonderfully simple kites. The same simple ones that we all grew up loving and loving to fly. And people just gathered here to relax, enjoy the cool air, and throw a little color up into the night sky. And also what uh, struck me is the, the image of you eating durian. <laughs> uh, so uh, you, you like durian. I do, yeah. It's my, yeah. my favorite fruit, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And what about other uh, dishes, Vietnamese uh, local cuisine? What else I, do you love, like? I love Vietnamese food. Um, I, fruit in particular, to be honest, like that's what I get most excited about, finding new okay. fruit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, all Vietnamese food is, is fantastic. And food or fruit? Food and fruit, both. Okay. <laughs> um, and it makes traveling especially fun when you find out the little bits of twists of mm -hmm. different dishes prepared different ways or... Um, it's funny, I can see the sparkle in your eyes when you talk about food. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's a cool, and I think it's a way to connect with people. It's that egalitarian element too, of like mm -hmm. everybody has to eat. I think that's why readers like Oh yeah, and you talked about street food and how accessible and how uh, unpretentious yeah. uh, it is. It is cheap, but it fulfills you. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's... It is what it is. It doesn't need any cover. Exactly, and there's no extra frills. It's not about how it looks. It's not about how you're dressed when you go to eat it. It's mm -hmm. not about how you've marketed it. It's not about how you put it on TikTok. It's just about what it tastes like and it 
accomplishes its caloric purpose, yeah. and it tastes good. And mm -hmm. So sh may I say it's a charm of Ho Chi Minh City? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you think that uh, these traits should be preserved and uh, should not be taken for granted? Yeah, I think as long as, I mean, things are going to change inevitably, whether that's food or music or art or literature. Mm -hmm. But I think everything deserves at least a chance of every generation taking a look at it and, and having the opportunity to decide if it's something that they want to continue with. More adjectives have probably been used to describe durian than any other food. Whether it's disgusting and rotten or heavenly and delicious, it's a very much love it or hate it fruit, even amongst locals. And I happen to be one of the people that love it. Durian is not cheap. Grown in the Delta or in the Highlands, it's brought into Saigon where people have an insatiable appetite for it. It's something that anybody that comes to Vietnam definitely has to try at least once. I think for me, it could probably wake me out of a coma if I smell it or instantly turn a bad day into a good one. Yeah, chào chị. Em muốn mua một sầu riêng. Một ký sầu riêng bao nhiêu tiền? Bữa nay sầu riêng một ký là 140 em. Sầu riêng nay loại Uh, em thích rì xào. Rì xào chồng ở ngay chỗ cái mơ miền Tây đồ nhiều em em. Dạ. Yeah. Ok. Ok, dạ, yeah, cảm ơn. Rồi, em vô đây, chị sẽ lựa cho em một uh, Ok. Hơn. Ok, so, we've selected one. I trust her more than I trust myself to pick one that's ripe and ready. It's not easy to cut open a durian. And one of the coolest things about durian is you never know how much fruit is actually inside. So it's kind of a surprise every time you open it. Ah, uh, this one's pretty good. And so it's always a mystery because you weigh it with the outside, with the heavy husk. But it's the fruit that's the only part you eat. And again, you never know how much fruit is going to be inside the durian. So it's always a bit of a mystery. So it's kind of like having a Christmas present that you're not sure what's inside. So there's always great tension as she continues to cut open the different parts. And we'll have to wait and see what's in there. Oh, that one's pretty good. Wow. It's sweet, it's fatty, it's rich, it's complex, it's smooth, it's almost indescribable. You really have to come have a taste yourself. Moi ngai? Chi an sao Moi ngai. Oh, my mang. If you smell it, and you will smell it when you're here in Ho Chi Minh City and try it, it's delicious. With all of what you've done, um, you, you engaged very closely with Vietnamese uh, writers, um, so uh, please enlighten us on uh, the cooperation between uh, writers here in Vietnam and their peers abroad. Yeah, I think it's been interesting to see how that's kind of changed over generations. So if you look back at like in the 80s and 90s and even early 2000s, there were still a lot of writers in Vietnam from the you know war era, the American war. And there were writers in America that were also from that. And so they had a very strong bond. And so there's been a lot of translation of anthologies and novels that really kind of came out of that former American soldiers and former Vietnamese soldiers letting literature be that tie. And that's produced a lot of great translations and great publications. I'm not from that generation. I don't have that. And people here that are my age don't have that connection. Um, so at the same time, with technological advancements and so much being online, so much being accessible online to younger generation, yeah. study abroad options, mm -hmm. fluidity of studying here, going abroad, coming back, disseminating information, collaborating across country lines, has opened kind of, for our generation, has opened that connection for literature. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's publications in Europe or publications in America, inviting a Vietnamese writer to edit a themed month. Mm -hmm or a Vietnamese writer that maybe gets an MFA in America and then comes back. Mm 
um, and shares what they learned with the community here. I see a lot of that. You are now devoting yourself to, to translating some Vietnamese literary works to introduce them to international readers. Uh, so how far have you gone? A few works should be coming out in the next year, uh, novels translated from Vietnamese into English that represent canonical works and also maybe some lesser known or appreciated works. Let me move on to the next question. Uh, you attended the 17th Vietnam Poetry Day, the 4th International Conference on Vietnamese Literature Promotion, and the 2019 International Poetry Festival, the Vietnam U.S. Literature Forum. Um, so through those events, uh, what can you say about the current development and foresee the prospect of Vietnamese American literary cooperation? Yeah, I mean, that, that was, fascinating to go to that literature event in Hanoi because we've already talked about how maybe academic opportunities aren't the same in Vietnam versus in the U.S. in terms of like pursuit of creative writing, especially like graduate school or, or postgraduate school. On the same token, you do not have in America huge government functions all dedicated to poetry. I and mean, for that event, we were traveled to Halong city and we had a police escort for a, a bus of writers. We're given police, you know, with their sirens blaring to deliver us somewhere. Mm -hmm. That would not happen. So whether that's kind of a formal government showing of appreciation or showing of value really was, was neat to see. Um, and so having Vietnam kind of extend that formal invitation to people outside the country via literature and via poetry, I think yeah. is a really good sign. Right, so uh, what about your future plans? Um, do you plan to leave or stay? <laughs> I have no plans to leave and I think there's, there's so much I still wanna do and, and I'm excited about and so many questions I have about everything that surrounds me and, and things that I feel I still am very invigorated by both for things I want to explore in my own writing and, and that I want to be able to translate and help translate and learn more about. Um, so I, I feel like I've got a lot to keep me energized and occupied here, so I have no plans to leave. I really would feel blessed to continue to stay. So thank you very much, Paul, for your sharing today. Um, and uh, hopefully that through uh, literature, uh, people can understand much more about Vietnam at a much deeper level. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, that's it for our episode today. I hope you enjoy it and see you again next time.